Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. I hope that 2019 was just a great year, but my biggest prayer is that 2020 even becomes a better year, not just in your life, but in the life of our church. And today I want to begin a series called 2020 Vision. Hey, don't you wish you had 2020 vision again? <laughs> Boy, I know I sure do. It gets kind of crazy sometimes when I try and look down at things with these things off and I can't see a thing <laughs> and I got to put my glasses on, but I'd love to have that, that 2020 vision. And for the next three weeks, I want to talk to you about a little bit of dream and about casting a vision for our church for the next 12 months. And also I want to challenge you about a vision for your life in 2000. 20. And I hope most of your New Year's resolutions and your visions don't look like this uh, video that Jen's going to help us with this morning. Amen. <laughs> Kelly, I found that was just for you about the road rage. <laughs> I was thinking of my wife on that one. Yeah. But isn't it amazing how we start off with all these great things about our vision and, and what we want to do in those New Year's resolutions and how quickly they change sometimes. But this morning I want to talk to you. You know, one thing I've learned, and I had a friend look at me a long time ago and he said, Mike, guess what? He said, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You ever heard that one? You know, if you aim at nothing, guess what? You're going to hit it every time. And I don't know about your vision for 2020 or what you're thinking, but you know, one thing I've learned is when I start talking to God and when I start talking about a vision or I start talking about my resolutions, it's between God and myself. And I can assure you this, God does have a plan for your life this morning. Every person in this room, God has a plan for your life, it's for your spiritual growth, for your personal growth, for your work, for your family, your personal relationships, and your service to others. As you seek him, he will, I promise this morning, he'll give you guidance, he'll give you directions, he'll empower you to accomplish what he's calling you to do. That's the most incredible thing I think about serving God, there's nothing that he's ever called me to that he didn't give me the strength and the power and the way to do it. Amen? And he'll do the same for you this morning. There's nothing he's going to call you to. There's nothing he's going to ask you to do that he won't give you the power and the strength to be able to do that. I love what Jeremiah says. He says, the Lord knows the plans he has for us. God says, I know the plans that I have for you. He has plans for all of our lives this morning. He has a vision that he wants you to help carry out in your life this morning. And so for the next three weeks, I want to look at some principles that I think will help us define and redefine your God-given vision for the coming year. These principles won't only help you to get started, but I'm really praying they'll keep you on track so you can look back at them again and again, and they'll help you. And guess who it starts with this morning? It starts with an old baseball player by the name of Ted Williams. Anybody remember that name that's followed baseball? 
Man, that goes back a little ways, doesn't it? Who was Ted Williams? He was a Hall of Famer Major League Baseball player in the 40s and the 50s. Actually, his Hall of Fame career was spanned from 1939 to 1960, with just an exception of 1943 and 1952, when he took off to serve our country in World War II and the Korean War. Every other season, he spent it with the Red Sox. Got any Sox fans in here? I'm a Reds fan myself, so I don't know much about the Red Sox. But got one back there, the Reds. But he spent the rest of his seasons with the Red Sox. And by every measurement, he was one of the all-time greats of the game of baseball. He was most notable for his achievement that he was the last batter to ever bat a 400 season. In 1941, he batted 406. Ted Williams was so effective at the plate. But one aspect of his secret power that was he was that he had excellent vision. He had excellent vision. It was called perfect vision in a lot of people's eyes. He could see far better than the average person. And this is what made him a, so good at baseball because of no matter how easy it seems when we're sitting in our recliner at home, baseball looks pretty easy, doesn't it? But you know that they say the hardest thing to ever do in any major sport is to hit a fastball in Major League Baseball. That's the hardest task, the hardest thing to do in any, in any sport that you'll ever play. When you're standing at that pitch and it's headed your way at 90 some, hour, 90 some miles an hour, you've got less than a second to decide if you're going to swing or where you're going to place your bat. But if your eyesight is so good that you can actually see the spin of the ball and the direction the seams are turning, you're able to determine whether that pitch is going to break, whether it's going to sink, or whether it's going to stay on course. And that gives you an advantage that nearsighted guys like me don't have this morning. It gives you an incredible advantage this morning. And what's important, and how does that relate to you and me this morning? I want to tell you just for a few minutes this morning and talk to you this morning. We talk about vision, and we often talk about it in the long-term sense as with this person has great vision for years to come, and they can see deep into the future, or, or she can anticipate trends and long-term things that really matter. The truth is that this certainty, this long-term aspect is important this morning, and being able to realize what's coming around the bend really matters. But this morning, I want to talk to you about this first principle this morning about living a vision-driven life. Vision begins. Listen to this this morning. Vision begins with the ability to see accurately what's happening in the present moment. Does that make sense? Vision begins with the ability to see accurately what's happening in the present moment. Man, you may have a dream of being a Hall of Famer. You know, I know as a kid growing up, man, I, I wanted to be something like that. You may even have an idea on how to get there. And you may, be, you may have this incredible, powerful swing. But if you can't see with precision the next pitch that's coming your way, you'll never get to the Hall of Fame. You'll never even get to first base. You'll just spend a lot of time going back and back and forth to the dugout. Now, Ted Williams had excellent vision. And it was a result of excellent genes. He was one of the lucky ones that was born with these incredible genes. And we're stuck with just the eyesight that we get at birth. And sometimes it's not perfect. But I want you to see this morning and understand that you don't, that the only thing I think that I could do if I was playing Major League Baseball, I could see the ball coming, but I don't think I'd ever have a chance of hitting it. And about the only thing I would know is when it hits the catcher's glove. You know? I could stand there all day long, and I could watch pitch after pitch come, and I don't think there's any way I'd even ever come close to hitting one of those balls. You have to have this incredible vision. However, when it comes to your spiritual vision this morning, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, when it comes to your spiritual vision or your personal vision, there are things that we can do to help it become more accurate in what's happening in the moment of your life. The better we see the moment, the better we can prepare for the months to come. Amen? The more that we understand the presence, the more we can prepare 
for the future. Let me say it more clearly this morning. Living with 2020 vision means that what we are able to see with precision and accuracy, who we are and where we are. Let me say that one more time. Living with 2020 vision means that we are able to see with precision and accuracy who we are and where we are. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 22 through 23. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. This means that in order to be people of vision, we need to come to the point where we're completely honest with ourselves about who we are where we are, and what changes we need to make. Are you hearing that this morning, church? If we want to come to the point where we really want to be all that God wants us to be, if we really want to be the servants, we really want to be the Christians, we got to come to the point where we're completely honest. That's not easy, is it? It's not easy to be honest with yourself sometimes because you don't want to hear what self is going to say. Self's got some pretty tough things to say once in a while, doesn't he? And sometimes we just want to hear it. But if we're ever going to change about who we are and where we are and where we're going to be, we have to listen to that. It's just like in the 12-step program. They call it taking a full, complete, personal inventory of yourself. And sometimes, church, we just need to stop and take a personal inventory of ourselves and where we really are and where God really wants to take us. I like what C.S. Lewis said about prayer. He said, we must lay before him what is in us, not what we think ought to be in us. Did you realize that? He said, we have to take before him what is really inside of us and examine that and not what we think we ought to be inside of us this morning. So, so this is true about taking personal inventory. We need to get to where we have a gut-level honesty about the reality that we're facing in this moment. When's the last time you really had a gut level, honest time with you and Jesus? Where you really ask him to take personal inventory and ask you where you were and where you needed to be. We kind of have a tendency to want to deceive ourselves, don't we? About what's happening around ourselves. We tell ourselves what we really want to hear most of the time, don't we? Well, it's really not an addiction. It's just something I enjoy. Or I don't really have a temper. I'm just intense. You heard that one before? I don't have a temper. I'm, I'm just intense. Or how about, you know, my relationship been on the rocks. We're just a temporary distraction. Ooh, I've seen where some of those distractions go sometimes, church. It's not good. Or we'll tell ourselves, you know, that, you know, it's not a rocky relationship. Like I said, it's just a temporary distraction. And we do this in so many areas of our life. We do it in our health. We do it in our finances. I know so many people, they wonder why they're in trouble financially. Well, when's the last time you really took a long inventory of how you're spending it and what you're doing with it and how much you're really giving to God? That makes a difference too, amen? About how we tithe and how we give to God this morning. And we worry about our careers and our families. And worst of all, our spiritual lives. Church, I worry about the spiritual life as the church as a whole all across America. My heart has been saddened this week as I've listened to the stories about my, from my friends in the Methodist church about where they're going and where they're headed and what might be happening to them in the next few months. It saddens me to see the spiritual condition of the church and where we are. It's time we really have an inventory with Jesus and we talk about where we are and who we are and what God really wants us to be. And we justify ourselves also in saying, in church, we say so many times to ourselves, that really isn't sin, Pastor. Church, we forgot about the real meaning of sin, I'm afraid, sometimes. We don't talk about sin sometimes and what it really is and call it what it really is. And so many times in our lives, we just say, well, they're just rebelling or, or we don't want to deal with that selfishness that we have inside of ourselves. It's not, we just want to say to ourselves, it's not what it really appears to be. We want to, we want to just kind of mask it and hide it. And we don't call it what it really is anymore. And so many times, church, it's sin. And we got to call it what it is, amen? 
And we've got to deal with it and let Jesus work on us and change us and mold us and shape us into what he really wants us to be. Hey, you remember that movie, The Wizard of Oz? And we all seen The Wizard of Oz. I like that part when Dorothy and the rest were trembling before the great power of Oz. And Toto spotted something specific behind the tiny room at the side. And he started barking. And he pulled the fabric that covered the doorway. And Oz says, remember what Oz says? He says, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, let me tell you this morning, church, vision begins with our ability to identify the man behind the curtain. Amen? Our vision and our dream and our purpose in our life begins when we identify the man behind the curtain. And we know who that is this morning. That's Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Creator, who has this incredible plan for you and for me. This morning, I just want to talk to you about a few steps that I really think will help us if we want to change our vision and we want to change our lives and we really want to become all that Christ died for us to be. And the first one this morning is to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us through this process. This isn't something we can do on our own. Not with clarity, because we have a tendency to see what we want to see rather than what we ought to see. Amen? Isn't that true? We just want to see what we want to see rather than what we ought to see. So, so many times, it's hard for us to be honest with ourselves. And we want to deceive ourselves know, and know that we sometimes can do that. But I like what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 19. He said, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The answer is that no one can understand it. It contains a code that no man can crack. Without the Holy Spirit to help us, we are at loss to understand who we are and where we are and where we're headed. But with the Holy Spirit's help, he will give us a glimpse of reality and where we ought to go if we'll just trust him. I like what Jesus said in John 14, 26. He said this, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Isn't that an incredible promise this morning? That no matter what you're dealing with, he says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And then I like what John 16, 3 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. Isn't that awesome to know this morning that that's the kind of God that we serve? And that he has power, and he has might, and he has strength this morning to set us free, no matter what we're facing or no matter what we're going through. I love that scripture, and I've shared it with you so many times. He who the Son sets free is free indeed this morning. God will give you direction and God will do things in your life. He has the power to do. And it's the power that comes through the Holy Spirit that enlightens us and guides us through the process. This is what the psalmist says in Psalms 139, 23 through 24. He says, seek me, O God. When's the last time you got before God, church, and you just said, God, seek Search me. Ooh. When's the last time you got honest enough with God to say, search me? Search me, God. Oh, God. And know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. And like, I love this part. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. That's a powerful verse. Amen. Lead me, guide me, search me, God, and lead me in the everlasting way. I love that passage. I love that phrase. Lead me in the everlasting way. When you invite the Holy Spirit to give you understanding of your deepest thoughts and your motives, he will. He promises that to, to us this morning. In doing so, he will lead you in the way of everlasting. He will move you in the direction God wants you to go in, and he'll give you grace, and he'll give you peace, and he'll give you his presence. One aspect of the Holy Spirit is to convict us and to correct us. He shows us where we miss the mark and how to make it right. He really does. It's amazing to me, church. I've never had a time 
And I can honestly say this, that when I honestly and wholeheartedly would seek God in a situation, in a problem, in something that I was facing, if I would be quiet and if I would be still and I would truly get before him, the Holy Spirit has never let me down. He's never failed me. He's always whispered to me and gave me direction and led me and guided me. If I truly was seeking him and I was truly asking for his guidance and direction, I promise you the Holy Spirit and that sweet spirit will speak to you. It will guide you. It will direct you. It will check you. And it will lead you in the right way if you'll trust him and really let him know you're dependent on him. He will do that for you. The Holy Spirit works with us in an incredible way, in a gentle way. Jesus referred to him as the comforter, our helper, and our guide. He doesn't criticize and condemn you or convict you. He speaks to you gently and tries to lead you through those things. God said this morning, he's our counselor. He's that still small voice that bears witness down deep within us. And he says, Holy Spirit, tell me what I need about myself, about my habits, about my life, about my goals and my directions and my faults and my failures. And he will guide you. He will direct you and he will lead you and will show you the plan that he has for your life if you'll just trust him this morning, church, and you'll go to him and you'll believe in him. God promises us that when he left, he would not leave us alone, amen? He promised us the Holy Spirit, the counselor, our everlasting friend that would be there. He said, I won't leave you as an orphan. I will leave you with the Holy Spirit to guide you and to direct you and to lead you if you'll just follow him with all your hearts, your souls, your minds, and your strings. And second of all, the Holy Spirit helps evaluate your strengths and your weaknesses. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing well? Where do I need to improve? I challenge you not merely just to write these or just to think about these things this morning, but I encourage you, maybe over the next day or so, sit down and, and write these things out and ask these questions prayerfully and make a list about, you know, what am I doing right, God? You know, what, what are some of the things I might not be doing so well? What am I am doing well? What do I need to prove on? And see how he starts to speak to you. I like what the book of Lamentations says in 340. He says, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Woo! I like that one. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Powerful stuff. And the psalmist wrote, in Psalms 4, 4, when you were on your bed, search your heart and be silent. When's the last time you just slowed down and were silent? My mind runs 90 miles an hour, it seems like, all the time. And there's times I just got to say, shut up, mind. You know, I got to listen a little bit. It's amazing what happens when I slow down and I start listening. The things that God starts checking me on and the things that God starts showing me. And I love what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6, 1. He says, each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone else. These verses are talking about spiritual discipline, self-examination, and knowing our weaknesses and knowing our strengths. And so many of us, so many of us have a hard time with our strengths, admitting that there's strengths and there's gifts and there's talents that God has given you. And it's okay to say, I'm good at that. Because he's guiding me and because he's directing me and because he's showing me the way. That God's given me this power. God's given me this gift. And I'm using it to my fullest. In church, so many times, God wants us to look at those things and let him know that we want him to use them and to guide us and direct us. But my, my challenge to you this week is to take a few quiet moments this week and with a pen and a paper, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in your list of strengths and your list of weaknesses and help him define where he's going to take you and how he's going to use you and how he's going to change those things in your life. And the third step I'd like to talk to you about this, this evening or this morning is consider this list is calling you to serve. Consider where this list is calling you to serve. Can I tell you this morning, you can be sure that in the big picture, in the long-term vision that God has for you, it's built around serving. It's built around serving. 
whatever it is he's called you to do, whatever he's asking you to perform in your life, he's chosen you, and he's given you the gifts, and he's given you the talents. And I love what Matthew 23, 11, it says, it says, the greatest among you will be your servants. Whatever God has in store for you, I promise you this morning, it involves serving other people. That's why Jesus came, was to seek and to serve and to help those in need. And that's, you know, the happiest people that I've ever met in the church are the serving people. Amen? The happiest people I know in the church are those that are involved, those that are giving, those that are trying to help, and those that are trying to make a difference in other people's lives. You know who some of the most miserable people I've ever met in the church are? Those who don't want to do anything, but just sit and come and go. God created us to serve. God created us to give back this morning. He's given you the ability to do something well, and he wants to use you in that area. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Whatever gift you've received, God is saying to you this morning, use it. I'll guide you. I'll direct you. If you'll let me have that ability, if you'll let me have that skill, I will use it. And he has areas that he wants to let you serve in, places that he wants to take you that you've never dreamt were possible. But church, also this morning, can I tell you this from even personal experience? He wants to use our weaknesses. He wants to use our brokenness. He wants to use our problems. He wants to use our setbacks, even your hurts and disappointments. God can taste the worst thing that's ever happened in your life, even your greatest failures, and he can use those to minister to other people. Because why? Because he says, in 2 Corinthians 2, 19, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in you. In my weakness, I become strong, church, because I have to rely on God, and I have to rely on his power and his strength and his might and his ways because I can't do it on my own. But when I am weak, he promises me I will be strong because he will lead me, he will guide me, he will direct me, he will use me. In church, so many times we look at all those things in our lives that have happened and say, why, how come? But God's got a purpose. God's got a plan. God's got a dream. That brokenness that you've gone through, that loss that you've gone through, those things that you have suffered through, you've got a testimony and you've got a light that you can bring to someone else and tell them, God helped me through it and I know he can do the same for you. And there's people that God's waiting for you to be Jesus to. I remember a few years ago, I met this unbelievable, distinguished older man by the name of Sam. He was one of the most loving, one of the most kind, considerate people that I'd ever met in my life. So courageous, so full of encouragement. He seemed like the person that probably went through life, never expected a problem, never had a problem, and just lived from mountaintop to ma mountaintop. And this may have been true at some point, but as we got to become friends and we started talking about his path in life and where the years had taken him, he began to share about the tragedies of his life of losing a son, the divorce he went through, the years of alcoholism, the years of bankruptcy and depression and despair, and even thoughts of suicide. And it was so hard for me to believe that he'd lived that kind of life. He said, I was one of the most broken men you could ever imagine. But he said, but when God got on the scene, God used my brokenness. God used my life to enable me to minister to those whose lives were also broken. So church, this morning, in areas of your life where you don't see any victory this morning, God has a plan to use your struggles for his glory this morning, amen? There are people that are just wanting someone to talk to, someone to identify with, someone to say, hey, I'm going through this. Do you understand it all? And it's amazing the things that you've gone through, the trials that you've had. God can use those for his glory this morning, amen? To make you be Jesus in someone's life and to make a difference in their life. And he can take that that raw vision that you may have today and develop it into this incredible masterpiece because you are a masterpiece 
in his sight this morning. Do you realize that? Jesus looks at you and he smiles this morning. And he says, that's my masterpiece. That's my child. I love them this morning. I want to take them. I want to use them. I want to mold them. I want to shape them into what I want them to be. Just imagine yourself being that clay in the potter's hands. And he's taking those edges and he's smoothing them off. And he's making you into this incredible masterpiece so that you can shine and so you can be used by him this morning. I love what Carl Jung said about vision. He said, your vision will become clear only when you can look inside your own heart. Your vision will become clear when only you look deep within your heart. He said, who looks on the outside dreams but he who looks on the inside awakens. He who looks on the inside awakens. And God's got a great awakening on the inside of many of us. If we would just let him guide and direct and lead our vision and lead our path and lead our goals in our lives. He's talking about seeing yourself, seeing your life with the kind of clarity we've been talking about this morning with precision, with accuracy about who you are and where you are. Ted Williams, was, as a kid, grew up with a dream of being one of the all-time greats. He had a dream of making it to the Hall of Fame. But before he could even be enshrined in Cooperstown, he had to have a perfect swing. And before he could swing, he had to have excellent eyesight. And he was one of the lucky ones that were born with that perfect vision. Our perfect vision this morning comes from the Holy Spirit, amen? From our Father, from our example, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad to know this morning that you serve a God who cared enough to send Jesus to walk this earth, to suffer through this earth, and to go through the same things that you've gone through so that he can understand? He understands this morning everything you're facing and everything you're going through. And he says, I've left you the Holy Spirit to guide you. God has a plan for your life, a long-term, big-picture vision for what he wants to accomplish in you. But before you can grasp this vision, you need to be able to see with accuracy and precision who you are and where you're at in this very moment. Church, I believe without a doubt God's got a great vision and a great plan for our church. But it's time to look really deep at ourselves again. And say, God, what's it going to take for you to use me? What's it going to take for you to guide me and direct me? I've sat now for four months and I've listened to your stories and I've listened to your families and I've listened to all the people that so many people seem to know in this congregation. And I'm going to claim this year, is, this is the year of one. I'm calling this, this is the year of one. Just one. What would happen if each and every one of us would just reach one? One person who's struggling, one person who's out there just wishing someone would be their friend, someone would care. I've listened to so many people and I've been to so many events about, well, I used to go there. Well, guess what? I bet with a little effort and a little call and a little prayer and a little bit of inviting them back, they'd come back again. It's been amazing when I first got here and I started making those phone calls on Saturdays. I'd have people go, you're who? You're who? <laughs> yeah, I'm the pastor. Pastor, you're inviting me to church again? And so it's been amazing to watch them come back one at a time and visit and check things out again. And I've listened to your stories about so-and-so who used to be your friend who used to come here. I was talking to Elizabeth and Sandy, and we were talking about all the different people that we don't even know where they are right now. We don't even know if they're going to church anymore. And what's sad church and what gets me sometimes, and I make these phone calls. I had a call with a lady just a few weeks ago, and she goes, Pastor, they don't care whether I'm there or not. I said, what do you mean? She goes, you're the only phone call I've gotten in a month, and I've been gone for a month. She says, it's real easy just to stay home because nobody really misses me. So church, I really believe with all, of our, with all my heart this morning, God's got one person that we could reach. 
if we change our vision, if we change our direction, if we open our hearts to his leadership and his guidance and his direction, he can help all of us win. So I want to claim this year is reach one, the year of one, all of us trying our best to reach just one person. Like I said, that person has been gone for a long time. That person that you work at, and say, God, give me the courage, give me the strength just to say something. And you'll be amazed how God will open the conversation and God will use you through your brokenness. You know, it's been amazing for me in, in my life and in my journey. God's had me on the mountains, but I've been in the valleys too. And I remember when I went through my divorce, it was one of the toughest things I'd ever faced in my life. I never thought in a thousand years it would ever happen to me. Never thought there was any way something like that could ever come my way or cross my path. But sometimes there's things that are just out of your control and that you can't help. And I can remember thinking, I'm done. I'm done. Whether it's my fault or not, I'm done. I'll never be able to preach again. I'll never be able to be a part of the church. And I can remember going through some of the most lonely days in my life. I was depressed and I was down and I was out and I'd given up church. I'd given up because all these people you thought you were your friends, all of a sudden I couldn't find them. And I was struggling and I was going through some depression and I was going through a ton of stuff in my life and I didn't know what the answer was or where I was going to turn. And finally, finally after months of hearing from no one and wondering where the church had gone, turning my credentials back in and saying, I'm done. I'm giving up on this thing. I can remember finally after a couple of months, this one friend calling me and just pouring out his heart to me and saying, Mike, you matter. I was beating myself up, something terrible, God, because I didn't feel like I mattered at all or I was worth anything. But he kept saying, you matter. God loves you and I love you and the church needs you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Listen to the Holy Spirit one more time and let him guide you and let him direct you. And he said, I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be here for you no matter what. And he called me every day for a month, praying for me, encouraged me. And day by day and month by month, the Holy Spirit started doing his work. He started doing his thing. He started speaking to me about, I still love you, Mike. I still care for you, Mike. I still want you to make a difference, Mike. I still want to use you, Mike. And I can remember all, all the pieces of the puzzle started coming back together in this life that thought I would never be able to minister again, never be able to touch people again, never ever be used in the church again. God started putting all the pieces back together because one person cared enough to say, I care, and to show me again that God cared. And church, I can't tell you the miracles and the things that have happened. And this incredible lady God left into my life when I thought I was done and nobody had ever loved me again. And how he's brought our lives together now and opened up this incredible call, this incredible ministry. And church, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the fact that one person decided I mattered. And I wouldn't be able to even be here and be your pastor today if he wouldn't have shown me he cared and that God loved me and God had a plan and God had a vision and God had forgiveness and God had grace and wanted to use me again. So from someone who's been there, can I tell you there's hundreds of others out there feeling the same thing, just going, where's the church? Where's those people who say they care? Where are those people that fill those buildings every Sunday and do their thing and then walk out the door and never do anything else again? Oh, church, what would happen if we would get down deep in our hearts that, man, this year, God, my vision and my purpose is just to reach one. Hopefully you might turn someone like my life around again where God could use me and God could allow me to minister and be his servant again.